At about 1.30 p.m. on Sunday the 19th of May 1991, the bodies of 32-year-old Trevor Buchanan, who had been a police officer at the time, and 31-year-old Leslie Howell were found in a Renault 21 estate car, and that was parked in a garage at the rear of Cliff Terrace in Castle Rock, Northern Ireland. So let's just take a look here where Castle Rock is. You can see the little map. Zoom all the way in. In Northern Ireland. Here we go. So Cliff Terrace itself is a row of cottages that overlooked the village, and it was known locally as the Twelve Apostles. It's actually located around here on the map. Um, if you can see my cursor there. Now, the bodies were found by a person known in court documents as Witness A and a police officer who at the time were both members of the Polreen Baptist Church, which I will load up on the map for us here, is located over in Colerine. Here we go, there's Colerine. So you can see they're not super far away from one another at quite a close distance. Trevor Buchanan was born on the 2nd of May 1959 in Omar, I believe it's pronounced, which is also in Northern Ireland. The parents, William Buchanan and Elizabeth Wilson. Now, not all too much is known about Trevor's upbringing, but what we do know is that in his early adulthood, he joined the police force and eventually became Constable Trevor Buchanan. He also met a woman by the name of Hazel, and the pair soon married, and they welcomed two young children into the world, moving to the area of Charnwood Park in Colreen, Northern Ireland. And let's take a look where that is on the map. Charnwood Park right here, so you can see it's close to the Baptist Church um, in a good, nice little area there. The family were respected within their local community and were active members of Coleraine Baptist Church. It was at this church that Trevor and Hazel first met a, another married couple who were called Colin Howell and Leslie Clark. I mean, it was Leslie Howell at the time. Now, Hazel had actually been working at the nursery that Colin's daughter Lauren had been attending. Now, I know there is a lot of names within this coverage. There's a lot of names going on. So these are the four main people within the case that are on screen now, and we will be showing them every time we're discussing where they are and everything like that. So Colin had actually been a Ballymoney-based dentist and had married Leslie in July of 1983. They had four young children living in Knocklade Park, which was also in uh, Colerine, which is located right there. Born Leslie Clark, now Leslie Howell, is the daughter of Harry and May Clark, and she had a brother by the name of Chris. Both Leslie and her brother were born in Plymouth, Devon, England. Fun fact, I once lived there for a while. And the family later then moved to Scotland before going to Dublin. Leslie actually met Colin, who would later become her husband, for the first time in Belfast, which is in Northern Ireland, whilst he was studying dentistry at Queen's University, as she was training as a nurse at the Royal Victoria Hospital. The couple began dating in 1981, and would marry in July of 1983. After they had married, the couple first moved to Port Bollentry and later to a house in Culmore Gardens in Colreen. Together, Leslie and Colin would welcome four children into the world, Matthew, Lauren, Daniel, and Jonathan. Leslie and Colin were both committed Christians and were very active within the Corrine Baptist Church. They were both involved in various church groups, with Leslie leading women's meetings at the church and attending Bible meetings. Now, in the spring of 1990, Colin had planned to buy a dental practice in Ballymoney, and at that same time, they moved into a bigger house in the Castle Rock area of Colerine. That summer, whilst Leslie was pregnant with their fourth child, Jonathan, she started to become increasingly worried about the family's financial difficulties. Now, before we delve further into this case, it is important to first establish that there were multiple investigations into what happened. Firstly, there was the investigation conducted by the police at the time this case, that this case took place. Secondly, there was a police investigation in 2009, and the reason for that will become clear later on. In the late 2000s to early 
Jones, the police ombudsman, they investigated, they had their own investigators conduct their own investigation into this case, and that will also become clear much later on. Now, we will be referring to the outcomes of these investigations throughout our coverage here, and I will note which investigators established what as we go through it. I'll just say what year it was and who exactly the team was. Okay, so with that being said, let's delve into the case. In the spring of 1990, Colin Howell and Hazel Stewart began an extramarital affair, and that lasted throughout the summer of that year. The secret affair wouldn't be kept hidden for too long, as in late September of 1990, Leslie, who was Colin's wife, found out about it. Now, there are actually several varying accounts as to how Leslie came to learn of the affair. When later interviewed by the authorities in May of 1991, so this is the first investigation, Colin Howell alleged that Leslie had become aware of the affair after she'd overheard him on the phone arranging with Hazel to meet up. Colin claims that he was challenged by his wife about this, and he denies that there had been anything going on between himself and Hazel, though he did eventually actually admit to having a platonic relationship with her. Further, Colin said that during counselling that was led by a senior member of the Coleraine Baptist Church, he confessed to the senior member that the relationship between himself and Hazel had been sexual. Interestingly though, when he was interviewed by investigators much later in 2009, Colin actually provided a different version of events. We'll touch on why the police were investigating again later on in his coverage, as I said earlier. He told the authorities this time that a fellow member of Coleraine Baptist Church had spotted him and Hazel in their respective cars at Castle Rock Forest Park which is known as a different name now. It's now known as uh, Downhill Forest, but this is where it is on the map. We will just go over there. So you see Castle Rock there, and that is where the forest park is just off to the left here. Let me bring the map across. There you go. He claims that this person then later phoned him and suggested that he inform the senior member of Coleraine Baptist Church before that this person did, so he basically threatened him. Colin claims that he had not disclosed initially that the relationship had been sexual between him and Hazel, but only did so to this senior member of the church once counselling had commenced. He claimed that this senior member of the church had arranged for him to confess to his wife Leslie at their home in October of 1990. Colin then alleged that it was after this incident that his wife Leslie had written a note which Colin claimed she had penned before the events of this case. We'll talk about that note much later on. Now the ombudsman um, investigators did actually try to verify these claims and they did establish that this person that threatened Colin, well allegedly according to Colin, had actually seen Colin and Hayes together at the Castle Rock Forest Park, Downhill Forest, but this person did not phone up Colin threatening to expose the affair. That's what they investigated and determined. Colin wasn't the only party to be interviewed again by investigators though, as also in 2009 they spoke with Hazel, who at this point was going by the name Hazel Stewart and not Hazel Buchanan. Hazel also provided a different version of events as to how exactly her affair with Colin was uncovered. She claims that she had confessed to the senior member of the church, known as Witness B, in the court reports, as she couldn't cope with the pressure of the affair any longer, especially as she had a high position within the church as a Sunday school teacher. Hazel's account was partially corroborated by Witness B, which is that senior member of the church. Witness B told the police when questioned again in 2009 that he had first become aware of the affair when Leslie had confided in him that she suspected Colin and Hazel were having an affair. Witness B further told the police that when he became aware of the affair, he confronted Colin, who denied its existence. But Witness B had not been convinced by Colin's denial, and so he confronted Hazel a few weeks later. Hazel initially denied the affair to Witness B, though she actually confessed that the affair had been ongoing eventually. Witness B stated that he then arranged a meeting between Leslie Howell and Colin Howell at their home address, which was where Leslie confronted her husband, Colin. Colin confessed some weeks later to Leslie that the affair with Hazel had, in fact, not just been platonic, but had also been sexual. And upon learning this, Leslie sadly took an overdose of paracetamol tablets before driving off from the family home. She was located later that day and admitted to Colrene Hospital, where she remained for several days. In the evening of the 13th of May in 1991, Colin began to formulate a plan. A plan that would see all his issues go away, 
in a plan that would let him live the rest of his life with Hazel, a plan to murder his wife Leslie and Hazel's husband Trevor. You see, Leslie had been inconsolable that night due to this affair being revealed and due to the fact that her father, Henry Clark, had passed away on the 7th of May, which was just six days earlier. Leslie had told Colin that he had destroyed the lives of Hazel's husband, Trevor, and her own life, and that around 2am to 3am she had sat up in bed and told him that she thought she would be going to heaven soon, and that maybe Hazel and Colin were meant to be together. It was when Leslie said that, in that moment, that Colin's plan for double murder was born. Colin began to formulate this plan as he lay in bed, convincing himself he was doing a good thing in ending Leslie and Trevor's pain, something he would later describe to the authorities as a form of euthanasia, which is shocking. I just can't comprehend how horrific that is. Colin met up with Hazel in the evening of the 14th of May 1991. Before we get into that bit, actually, real quick, guys, you know, if just end the marriage, just end the marriage, get a divorce, separate, it's so much easier. And you don't end up in prison and nobody else dies, you know? Divorce is far easier than murder, guys. Seriously, just break up. End it. Also, the fact that he's talking about euthanasia, about his own wife, just goes to show his opinion on his wife, if that makes sense. You talk about euthanasia when you're talking about an animal, your dog, a cat, that kind of thing. We're talking about human beings here. Regardless, Colin met up with Hazel in the evening of the 14th of May 1991, and he explained her plan to her and the role that he expected her to play as a part of this plan. He told her that he would murder Leslie at his home and then drive to the Buchanan house where he would murder Trevor. Colin intended to stage a suicide scene so that it would appear that they had formed a suicide pact and had died together from carbon monoxide poisoning. Hazel would later claim that she did didn't understand the intricacies of Colin's plan, but Colin stated that she was fully aware that he planned to murder his wife and her husband, and that while Hazel was afraid of being caught, she didn't object to the plan. Colin gave Hazel a pack of blue lorazepam tablets, which is a prescribed drug used in the treatment of anxiety and insomnia. Colin explained to Hazel that she needed to mix these into Trevor's evening meal on the night in question, to ensure that Trevor was in a deep sleep when he arrived at the house. Colin was fearful that, being a serving police officer, Trevor would have a personal firearm in his house. So he was concerned about that, so he gave um, Hazel these sleeping pills basically to make sure that he was asleep. Now Hazel was also to ensure that the family's car was left outside their garage and that the garage was left open so that Colin could drive his car inside. She was also to arrange a change of clothes for Trevor and to make sure that the fireplace was cleaned out to allow evidence to be burned afterwards. Now Hazel would later contest this version of events when initially interviewed by the police in the second investigation in 2009. Hazel claims that Colin had merely made a throwaway remark on one occasion that they would be better off if Trevor and Leslie were dead, prior to laughing and changing the subject. Eventually though, she confessed to her knowledge of and involvement in the murders. The sole point that she continued to deny was within all of this confession everything, was that Colin had given her tablets which she was to use to drug Trevor's food. So that's one of the things that she categorically denied ever happening. Hazel stated that she had assisted Colin as she was frightened of him and feared that if she had not complied then he would have murdered her and her children. Whatever the case, the plan was set in motion. Saturday the 18th of May 1991, was the birthday of one of Colin's and Leslie's children. On that day, Leslie had left their house at around 11am for a hair appointment and had returned at around 2pm, which was when she prepared meals for that day and the next day before leaving the house again at around 5.30pm. Or at least that's Colin's version of events. Colin's account that his wife Leslie had been at home all afternoon actually conflicted with other accounts of her movements. Witnesses stated that Leslie had been in a boutique and coffee shop that afternoon, though 
No details were collated by the police in the initial 1991 investigation about the specific times that Leslie had been there. Police ombudsman's investigators would later establish that Leslie had been upstairs in the coffee shop from about 4 p.m. that afternoon before going into the downstairs boutique at around 4.30 p.m., which is where she bought a dress and then left at about 5.15 p.m. Leslie was next seen at a tanning salon near Castle Rock at 6 p.m., which was where she was booked in for a sunbed session. Leslie's sunbed appointment, however, was actually for 7 p.m., so she was super early for it. She told a staff member that she would just go and get her tea, her dinner, before returning at the correct time. Leslie was next seen at a filling station, so a gas station, outside Colrean at around 6.15pm. The person who saw Leslie became concerned as Leslie, who was someone she knew, had stopped at the diesel pump and appeared to be in the process of filling her car, which is that Renault 21 estate car, and any of you who may have had experience with them knows that that kind of car has a petrol engine. This person said that she went outside to tell Leslie that she was at the wrong pump, but by that point, Leslie had corrected herself and gone to the right pump. The person said that Leslie's actions were very slow, and it was as if she had been operating in slow motion. This person describes Leslie as staggering from side to side when walking into the shop to pay for her petrol. The person further made a point of smelling Leslie's breath to see if she could detect any alcohol on it, but according to this person, her breath did not smell alcohol. The person was so concerned, actually, that she phoned and spoke to Colin, Leslie's husband, to inform him of Leslie's behaviour. Colin would actually then phone this person back up 15 to 20 minutes later to tell her that Leslie had safely returned back home. When questioned about this in the first investigation in 1991, Colin did tell the police that Leslie had returned home for a brief period between being seen at the filling station and returning for her sunbed appointment at 7pm. Colin said that she had been very calm and had underplayed the filling station incident. And Colin's account of when Leslie had returned to the house was supported by someone known in the court records as Witness C, who was a neighbour and friend of Colin and Leslie's. Witness C stated that he had seen Leslie driving past his house at speed at around 6.20pm headed towards her own house. Now, a staff member at the tanning salon said that Leslie had returned at 7pm for her appointment and described her as being in good form. Leslie went in for her 25-minute treatment on the sunbeds, but she had not come out by 7.30pm, causing one of the salon's staff members to go and check on her. The staff member found Leslie asleep on the sunbed and gently woke her up. Leslie left the sunbed a few moments later and made an appointment for another session on the 20th of May 1991 and as she left told the staff see you Monday. Colin claims that when Leslie returned home following this appointment she had a three litre case of wine which she began to drink while sitting on the living room sofa. According to Colin Leslie had begun to drink heavily after her father's death and would often have fallen asleep with a quilt on the living room sofa. Witness B who is the senior member uh, at the church told the police in the 2009 investigation, so the second investigation, that he had been aware of Leslie's increased drinking and that he had warned her to cut down on it. It appeared to him, at least, that she was going downhill and, quote, had lost much of her spark. It was at this time that Colin knew that his plan had to go ahead that night. Telling the police later in the 2009 investigation, quote, we have to do this tonight. I couldn't stand it any longer definitely have to do this tonight. We can't go through this again. I can't put her through this, drowning her sorrows, you know, that made her life awful. Now, Colin phoned Hazel at her home using a code that the two of them had developed during their affair. Colin would hang up before the first ringtone, resulting in a click on Hazel's line. Hazel, knowing that Colin wanted to speak to her, would then return the call when free to do so. Hazel had been out with Trevor Buchanan, her husband, shopping in Lisbon, missing Colin's initial attempts to contact her during the day on that day. When she returned home, she heard a click on the telephone and called Colin immediately. When she did, Colin informed informed her that the plan was going ahead that night. According to Colin, she asked him if he was serious, to which he responded that he was and that she replied, okay. He went over what was required of her and said that when he next called, she would know that Leslie 
was dead. Whilst initially denying any prior knowledge of Colin's intentions that night, during her 2009 police interview, so the second investigation, Hazel eventually admitted that she had been aware of the plan and her role in it when she spoke to Colin that evening. Colin said that Trevor complained that night of having problems sleeping, and so Hazel had suggested that Trevor take something to help him get to sleep. She stated that she had no idea if Trevor had taken any sleeping aids or not. Hazel stated that she had gone for a cycle ride with a friend prior to preparing supper at about 9.15pm, and then going to bed at around 10.15pm. The only living witness as to what exactly happened next to Leslie is Colin. Colin told the police in 2009 in the second investigation that towards midnight he observed Leslie in a deep sleep on the sofa with a quilt pulled up to her neck. By this time the children were asleep and had been put to bed. Colin went to the garage and attached a pre-selected hose pipe to the exhaust pipe of their Renault 21 car using a baby feeding bottle which he had actually adapted earlier on so that its sawn off base fitted over the exhaust pipe and its top over the uh, hose pipe to ensure a tight fit. He then fed the hose pipe into the living room before returning to the garage and turning on the car's ignition. He went back into the living room and took the hose pipe under Leslie's quilt as he was concerned it would take too long for the fumes to fill the room. Colin then watched from the living room door, which he left slightly ajar. I may also just point out that during all of this, guys, um, his children were asleep upstairs. And if anyone here knows anything about carbon monoxide poisoning, you know that it's a silent killer and it can easily go through floors and it can move through a house. He was putting his children at risk as well at this point. This just goes to show what kind of a person Colin was. Now, at some point, Leslie began to stir, and concerned that she would wake up, Colin went back into the living room and pulled the quilt over her head. Leslie cried out the name of their eldest child, calling out for her eldest child, before becoming overwhelmed by the fumes and succumbing to the fumes. Colin kept the ignition on for two more minutes prior to turning it off and allowed an extra 15 minutes before re-entering the room. He wrapped up the hose pipe and then carried Leslie's body out to the garage, placing her in the boot of the car. He placed the bed sheets and his bicycle on top of her. Now in the spur of the moment, Colin picked up Leslie's personal cassette player and three framed family photographs prior to phoning Hazel at around 1am using their special code that they'd developed. Upon hearing her phone click, Hazel phoned him back. Colin informed her that he was finished with Leslie and says that he was en route to the Buchanan address. So whilst initially denying any knowledge as to why Colin was coming to her house, Hazel later admitted to the police in the second investigation in 2009 that she had known the real reason for the visit. Now by now, Trevor was asleep in bed. Hazel had ensured that the car was out of the unlocked garage, as it she'd been told to do, and upon Colin's arrival, Colin reversed his car into the garage. He confirmed with Hazel that Trevor was asleep prior to carrying out the same set of actions which he had performed with Leslie, setting the end of the hose pipe on the pillow next to Trevor's head. He then retreated to the bedroom door from which he observed the effects of the fumes. Trevor stirred, raising his head, and he looked around. Upon seeing this, Colin ran back into the room and tried to pull the quilt over Trevor's head. A struggle ensued and both men rolled off the bed onto the floor. During this, Colin sustained an injury to his head. Once on the ground, the two men continued to struggle on their knees. Colin told the police in 2000 2009 in the second investigation that he placed the nozzle of the hose pipe which was connected to the exhaust pipe of the car had all these toxic fumes into Trevor's mouth quote almost like between his teeth. Trevor then took a deep breath of the fumes and went limp. The effects of the fumes were such that Colin had to run from the house into the back garden to clear his own head. As the struggle had ensued between Trevor and Colin, Hazel had been in an adjoining room with her hands over her ears as to drown out the noises coming from the bedroom. When Colin returned to the house and turned off the car ignition, he dressed Trevor in the clothes that had been left out for him by Hazel. 
He handed Hazel the hose pipe and instructed her to cut it up and burn it in her fireplace. He dragged Trevor from the bedroom, through the kitchen, and into the garage. Upon passing through the kitchen, he noticed a half-eaten tuna roll with chunks of blue tablet through it. Hazel denies having placed any tablets in Trevor's food. Now Colin placed Trevor on top of Leslie in the boots and covered him with a second bed sheet and then put his bicycle on top of both of them. He stated that he had told Hazel that he would phone her when he got back home and that he did not tell her where he intended to go next. Hazel lit a fire disposing of the evidence as she had been instructed and aired the bedroom out before washing the bed sheets. She then awaited Colin's phone call. Colin stated that he had initially planned to stage the suicide scene on the beach at Castle Rock but he actually changed his mind. Let's take a look at the beach here. So this is the beach where um, he initially wanted to carry out this stage suicide, but he had changed his mind um, as he had worried about being seen by an early morning jogger leaving footprints in the sand. So he decided instead to drive to the home of Leslie's recently deceased father, which is Six Cliff Terrace, which I'll bring up on the screen here. There we go. Six Cliff Terrace, to which uh, he had access to. Colin described this decision as, quote, last minute. He left his bicycle along the route in Long Grass at a roadside verge on Barmouth Road, which is all the way over here. So he left the bicycle a bit of a distance away. And from there, Colin drove around the back of the cottages and reversed his car into the garage. The garage itself was described as being a very confined space. Wearing surgical rubber gloves whilst in the garage, he opened the boots and dragged Trevor's body along with the driver's side of the car where there was more room. He was unable to place Trevor's body fully in the driver's seat and had to leave him sitting slumped low with his right leg protruding from the car. And this meant that the he couldn't close the driver's side door. Colin then returned to the boots where Leslie's body had been laying and placed the cassette player's headphones over Leslie's ears before arranging those three family photographs around her. He then inserted one end of a vacuum cleaner pipe into the car's exhaust pipe and the other into the boots close to where Leslie's body lay and uh, Colin said that this vacuum cleaner pipe had actually been in the boot of that car for several weeks as he had intended to take it for repair but he'd never gotten around to it so it's kind of convenient for him to put that in there. He then faced a predicament. The open driver's door barred his exit from the garage along the driver's side of the car, whilst its passenger side was parked too tightly against the workbench, meaning he couldn't get past the car at that side either, so he had no real way of getting out once he turned on the engine. Colin turned on the car's ignition regardless. He wound down the front driver's side window in order to create a sort of stepping stone, which he used to climb over the door. Colin then closed the garage door behind him. He jogged onto Castle Rock Beach and along it before going to where he had left his bicycle and then he cycled home. Now, upon getting home, he burnt the clothes that he had been wearing alongside the rubber gloves he'd worn and two bed sheets which he'd used to place over Trevor and Leslie. And following that, Colin phoned Hazel and told her that he was home. It was at that point that Colin realised that he had sustained a bump to his head during the struggle he'd had with Trevor. He told Hazel that he would tell the police when inevitably questioned and interviewed that Trevor had come to his house that night and that there had been a struggle, which is why he got the injury. He instructed Hazel to tell the police that she had heard Trevor talking to Leslie in their house at around 3am to 4am. It wouldn't be long before the horrors that Colin and Hazel had committed would be revealed. At around 8.30 a.m. on the 19th of May 1991, a church elder, who is named as Witness A in court records, received a phone call from Colin informing him that Leslie had been missing all night and that her car had gone missing. Colin told Witness A that he suspected that Leslie had gone off with Trevor and asked for his help in finding them. Colin suggested that Witness A go check the 12 Apostles as they might be there, the 12 Apostles being the nickname for the Clifffront properties in Castle Rock, one of which being the home of the recently deceased father of Leslie. Witness A subsequently drove to Colin's house and was shown a quote-unquote suicide note that had supposedly been written by Leslie. He then drove to the Twelve Apostles, which as we know in the garage of uh, number five, oh no, number six, sorry, 
was both of the bodies, but he couldn't see any sign of the missing couple. He returned back to Colin's house and informed him of this, though Witness A had failed to check the garage at the premises. It was at that point that Colin suggested that they may have boarded a ferry to Scotland, which saw Witness A phoning the ports to check. Though Witness A learned after phoning all of these ports that Leslie's car had not boarded a ferry the previous night or early that morning. Now, shortly before 9am, Colin made a second phone call, though this time Colin asked Witness C to go check out the 12 Apostles to go check out whether they could see Leslie or Trevor there. So Witness C drove to the address, but he was also unable to find anyone in the house. So Witness C went to the rear of the cottages where he looked through the garage's window and saw a car with an open driver's door. But before he could investigate any further, he saw what he thought to be movement from an upstairs rear window at number six. Witness C believed this to be Trevor and Leslie. And so he shouted to them to catch themselves on, which is kind of a saying for being like, what are you playing at? Before driving back to Colin's house and updating him as to what he had seen. Shortly after Witness C had left to go and see Colin, his wife actually received a phone call from Hazel saying that Trevor had not come home that night after having gone out with Leslie. Witness C's wife then traveled to the Buchanan house, which is where she found Hazel in a, quote, distressed state. Now, witness A had been at a morning service uh, at the church when he received another phone call from Colin at around 12.45 p.m. And Colin asked him to return to the 12 apostles, to return to Leslie's late father's house. Colin added that this time he would give witness A the keys to the property. On this occasion, witness A took a police officer known as Police Officer 3 with him. They went to Colin's house and collected the keys and then the two men arrived at the cottages at around 1.20 p.m. They searched through the house looking for any sign of Trevor or Leslie. Witness A then went round to the back of the cottages and opened the garage door, discovering the bodies of Trevor and Leslie. He immediately shouted for police officer three, who entered the garage to check for signs of life, though sadly he found none. He retraced his steps closed the garage door and phoned up the station to inform them as to what they had found. And we're going to jump over now and take a look at the EDF from the official police reports from the uh, investigation itself. Now this does refer to people using their last names. I'll be replacing them with their actual names as we go through it and I'll be highlighting as we go. So this again is from actually the a much later police on ombudsman investigations. Um, so it's kind of ran like that. So let's get through it. Now, records obtained from the police station showed that police officer three phoned the police at 1.35 p.m. on May 19th, 1991 to report the incident. They show that he contacted the police by telephone and it is documented that he reported a double suicide. The duty sergeant and inspector immediately attended the scene together. Both were un ununiformed officers at the time. They were driven there by a constable who is actually a close friend of Trevor Buchanan who again was a constable himself. Now upon realising that one of the bodies was his friend, the constable immediately left the scene, which is the protocol. So the on-call crime investigating detective, I believe that is CIDs, probably, uh, inspector that day, who was known as Police Officer 1, was contacted and according to his records, he attended the cottages at 1.40pm. It is believed that this is the time that he f was first informed of the incident. On his attendance, as the most senior police officer present, he was put in charge of the scene. He phoned the senior detective on call that weekend within the Colerine area, who was known as Police Officer 2, to inform him of the deaths. So this is what they discovered within the garage. So the scene was photographed by an RUC photo uh, photographer and he arrived at 2.30 p.m. and he subsequently produced 16 photographs of the scene. Eight of these were duplicate images, meaning that in effect there were eight photographs of the scene taken, so he took multiple of the same. Two of these were of the exterior of the garage and six were taken in the interior. We don't have these photographs on hand, just so you know. The photographs taken in 1991 were of the scene which the police had encountered. It shows that Colin's car had been reversed into the garage so that its front was pointing towards the garage door. It had been parked with its passenger side tight to a workbench, as we know, which didn't allow any access along that side 
side of the vehicle. There was more room on the driver's side, which would have allowed a person to walk along between the car and another workbench. Uh, the driver's door was open, as was the driver's window. The car keys were even the ignition, which was in uh, the on position, so the car was turned off. Now, a number of those present commented on the, upon the strong smell of car exhaust fumes when they entered the garage. There is no record, though, that the police conducted checks at that time to ascertain if the car's fuel tank was actually empty. Police Officer 1 has a record that the car engine was not running at that time, so it's likely it ran out of ran out of fuel but they didn't do any checks to make sure. Travis's body was positioned in the driver's seat as we know but lying low down so that his back was almost parallel to the seat's base. His right hand was on the steering wheel and his left leg was buckled under him in the driver's footwell. His right leg was partially out of the car with his right knee positioned in the hinge of the driver's door. Leslie's body as we know was found lying on her back across the boot of the car with a personal cassette player beside her. It's headphones uh, as we know were over Leslie's ear. According to the reports, a gospel music tape was playing on the cassette player. Uh, there was no record as to how much of the tape had been played. So positioned around Leslie's body, as we know, were those three family photographs that were framed. Two of these were facing away from Leslie and one of them was facing towards her. The one facing towards her was a photograph of Leslie in her nursing uniform with her mother. Interestingly, there were no photographs of her children. So next to Leslie's head was one end of a vacuum cleaner pipe. The boot was covered, boot was covered in what appeared to be a layer of soot boots being what we call a trunk uh, what we call a trunk here in the UK. Boot was covered in what appeared to be a layer of soot. The other end of the pipe was sitting loosely in the exhaust pipe and it was not airtight. The exhaust pipe on close inspection had a dark ringed mark around it suggesting that something had been attached tightly to it. Photographs showed the boot door wide open however when the bodies were discovered by witness A and police officer 3 it was closed on top of the vacuum cleaner pipe. When opened this revealed a visible kink in the pipe where the boot door had been resting on it. Forensic medical officer FMO did attend the scene um, and they pronounced uh, no signs of life, life extinct at 2.15 p.m. This medical officer suggested that the bodies were cold and that there were signs of lividity which suggested that both had been dead for at least 12 hours so rigor mortis setting in. A scenes of crimes officer or SOCO also attended in order to examine the scene forensically. Now several items were removed by her for potential forensic examination. Interestingly no scene log was opened and the police ombudsman's investigators were unable to confirm when the police entered or left the scene which is basic basic policy there basic procedures and no sketches or measurements were taken at the scene so looking at the witness accounts according to police one's police notebook and journal from 4 p.m he was at the buchanan address obtaining witness statements witness accounts from hazel witness c and the wife of witness b these are all people that are involved in trying to find leslie and trevor when they went missing hazel stewart told police officer one the story that she had previously agreed with colin that their initial friendship had developed into a sexual affair by the summer of 1990 and that this has lasted throughout september of 1990 during which they were having sexual intercourse around once a week she said that leslie had found out about the affair and that colin and hazel had entered into counseling led by witness b who was the senior member at the church now, according to Hazel, the affair had ended at this time, but both Trevor and Leslie had been unable to come to terms with their respective partners' infidelity. Hazel continued that on the evening of the 18th of May 1991, she had gone for a cycle ride with a friend before going to bed at around 10.15pm. She said that Trevor had told her that he planned to stay up for a while. She told the police that she had fallen asleep, but had been awakened during the night by the sound of Trevor and Leslie's voices in the house. She could not make out what they were saying, but believed that this had occurred between 3 and 4 a.m. She stated that she did not intervene as Leslie and she had not been on speaking terms at that time. Hazel then fell asleep and woke up again at around 5 a.m. and Trevor had not been in his bed and his car was still parked in front of the house. Well, it was actually parked in front of the house, sorry, whereas normally it would have been parked in the garage, which was a bit strange. Hazel didn't contact anybody at that time as she didn't wish to cause alarm and she recalls that witness A had phoned her at about 9am to inquire as to Trevor's whereabouts. If you cast your minds back, Colin had contacted witness A at like 8am and told him that they were missing. So police officer one made written notes of this interview but did not record a statement from Hazel at that time. His notes indicate that witness C and the senior officer from Colreen at the time were present during this interview. It was later established that witness C had a little 
very little rec recollection of the interview itself. The senior police officer declined to provide a statement to the police ombuds ombudsman investigators, but a review of the 1991 police investigation papers established that he didn't play a, any further part in the investigation. So police officer one also interviewed the wife of witness B and also witness C. His notes reflect that witness B's wife said that she had been aware of the affair between Colin and Hazel and of the subsequent suicide attempt by Leslie Howell, which she described as serious. So if you cast your minds back uh, and remember that Leslie did attempt on her own life by attempting to overdose on paracetamol, which saw her being uh, hospitalized for a brief time. So there was a history there, which I think is something that Colin played on. So witness C stated that Trevor Buchanan had attended his house the previous evening at around 8 p.m. to repair a puncture of his wife's bicycle following her, her cycle ride with Hazel. He described Trevor as being quite white and recalled Trevor making the remark, it was no good, it was no good prior to leaving. At the time, witness C thought that Trevor was referring to the puncture. He added that prior to that, he had observed Leslie driving at speed towards her own house at around 6.20 p.m. Witness C told police officer one of his visit to Cliff Terrace, which is where the bodies were found on the morning of the 19th of May, 1991, and of telling Colin that he had observed movement in number six. So at 7.30 p.m., police officer one attended Colin's address where he interviewed Colin made written notes but did not record a statement at that time and accompanying him during this interview was police officer two. Colin gave a similar version of events to that provided by Hazel as to how the fair had started and that it had been covered in September 99 that he had denied it it was platonic platonic and then admitted it was uh, sexual. It goes on to say though that he told the officers that Leslie had changed following the death of her father and had begun to drink every evening at home as we know and taking temazepam tablets. He said that they had argued a lot about the affair and that Leslie had often said that she was leaving the children and him and going to London in order that he could have Hazel to himself. Colin goes on to describe the day of 1991 as we went through it. Um, detailing Leslie's visits to petrol station and tanning studios and her drinking that evening. Uh, he said that Trevor Buchanan had arrived at the house at around 11.15pm and that an argument had ensued which resulted in Trevor grabbing at him and him having to restrain Trevor. Colin alleged that it was at this time that he had sustained a injury to his forehead. He says that Trevor then apologised to him and left. He then went on to say that he went to bed around 10 past midnight, leaving Leslie very drunk on the living room settee when she had become accustomed to sleeping. He said that he woke up, woke up the next morning to find that Leslie was gone, that Leslie had written a suicide note which was lying on the kitchen floor and that was when um, he raised the alarm. Okay so the post-mortem examination was here. I know there are a lot of people involved here. We've got three different police officers, three witnesses, and the four people, named people, that are involved in this case. So not, I hope everyone's following along here. I hope everyone's following along okay. So the post-mortem examinations themselves, the reason why the police officers are police officer one, two, and three is because of the um, ombudsman investigation. That's why they're like witnesses to the investigation and stuff. Usually they would be referred to as their name in court documents. So police officer one attended the post-mortem examination of Trevor and Leslie at 8.15pm and 9pm respectively on the 19th of May 1991. These were conducted at the Corrine Hospital Mortuary by an assistant state pathologist. Police Officer 1 briefed the pathologist before the examinations. Both bodies were photographed and the relative and relevant photographs were not referred to in the subsequent coroner's report, which is interesting. The pathologist describes both Trevor and Leslie as being healthy adults. No physical injuries were noted to Leslie, but with regards to Trevor, he noted a one centimeter abrasion to the front of his right knee and two abrasions, one two centimeters and one half a centimeter, to the front of his left knee. He described these injuries as of trivial nature. Nothing suspicious was noted during either post-mortem examination and no further detailed examinations were conducted. Also in attendance were the Rook Soko, who had earlier attended the garage scene and the Rook photographer who was not connected to the inquiry up until that point. The SoCo, who is basically the forensics person, recovered Trevor's jeans and sweatshirts for forensic examination. There are no police records to indicate whether or not Leslie's clothing was taken for forensic examination too. We don't know. The subsequent post-mortem reports prepared by the pathologist reveals that both Trevor and Leslie had died from carbon monoxide poisoning. Trevor's blood contained a 71% concentration of carbo... carbo? hex hemoglobin. I can't... Carb 
Carboxyhemoglobin. Carboxyhemoglobin. Thank you very much. Whilst Leslie's reading was 61%, both fell within the recognized fatal range. Leslie also had a blood alcohol level reading of 117 milligrams over 100 milliliters, and the current legal limit for driving uh, was 80 milligrams over 100 milliliters, so way above the legal limit for driving. And that her blood contained traces of tepazumam, 0.24 milligrams milliliter, and diazepam, 0.35 milligrams over a millimeter, and nor diazepam. I'm, I'm, I feel like all these are different variants of sleeping aids. So Trevor had no alcohol in his system, but his blood contained traces of temazepam, 0.13 milligrams. The pathologist concluded that the alcohol reading was not high, and that the drug readings fell within the therapeutic range. He concluded that it was unlikely that the presence of either drugs or alcohol had contributed to the deaths. Police Officer 1 was made aware of these toxicology findings on the 31st of May 1991. Even though this blood alcohol reading is high compared to the uh, legal limit for driving, it's not super high. So further inquiries. So in the weeks following the deaths, police officer one conducted a number of further inquiries. So on the 22nd of May and 23rd of May 1991, Police Officer 1 recorded formal witness statements from Colin and from Hazel, respectively. Both provided accounts consistent with what they had told the police on the 19th of May 1991. On the 23rd of May 1991, Police Officer 1 recorded a statement from the next-door neighbour of Trevor and Hazel Buchanan. The neighbour said that he had been in his bathroom at approximately 3.40am on the 19th of May 1991 when he had heard footsteps outside. He said that he'd seen a vehicle reversing from the Buchanan driveway onto the main street. Street. He could only say that the vehicle was dark coloured and that he had assumed that it was somebody calling at Trevor's house connection with his police duties. So on the 28th of May 1991, a meeting took place between Police Officer 1, Police Officer 2 and Police Officer 3 at Ballymena URC station. Police Officer 3 had asked for this meeting to take place. Police Officer 1's notes of the meeting indicated that Police Officer 3 had relayed concerns about Colin giving his wife medication to help her sleep, which enabled him to meet up with Hazel. So there we go. Colin was giving this medication. Further, that Colin was well known to tell lies and that Police Officer 3 was genuinely concerned Concerned and considered that Colin was in some way responsible for Leslie's death. He did not go as far as saying that he believes Colin had murdered the victims. Police Officer 3 also suggested that the detectives met with Witness D, or a different person, I believe it's a wife or something, uh, and her husband, as he believed they held information of relevance to the police investigation. So the police at this point knew that something a little bit, a little bit strange, a little bit strange. Now, Police Officer 3 provided a witness statement to the police in 1991, which formed parts of the subsequent coroner's report. However, this only referred to the discovery of the bodies and did not make reference to any of these concerns, which he had raised with the police during the meeting with police officers one and two. So at least one of these police officers saw that something, something suspicious was going on here, something shady was happening. Police officers one and two subsequently visited witness D um, and her husband, I believe witness D is the wife of one of witness A, B, or C. <laughs> I know it's a little confusing there. Witness D provided information about the relationship between Colin and Leslie Howell, which was of great significance and which will be commented upon later in this report, in this public statement, they call it here. The statement was also recorded from witness A, which referred to his two visits to Six Cliff Terrace on the relevant date. Witness A was the one who went over to the house where the bodies would later be found multiple times, but the second time he thought that he had uh, seen movement. On the 29th of May 1991, Police Officer 1 attended car sales premises with a forensics team to examine the Renault 21. So the Renault 21 was the estate car in which Leslie and Trevor were found. The car, there we go, a Renault 21. That's not an actual picture of the actual car, but that's what the car would have looked like. By the looks of it, Colin had taken it and put it up for sale. I'm guessing that this car was not brought in for some reason. Um, for forensics or anything? I don't really know. They noted damage to the rear offside light cluster. And following that, they attended the garage at number six Cliff Terrace, which is the property in which the car was found with the bodies inside. And that is where they examined the area around the doors, uh, garage doors exterior, looking for signs of broken glass, matching that of the damaged light cluster, but no glass was located. Now, it has been established that Police Officer 1 conducted this inquiry in order to ascertain how damage was caused to the car. Now, when in interviewed by the police in 2009, so this is the second investigation, which we'll get to, Colin stated that when he was reversing the car into the Buchanan address prior to murdering Trevor, 
He drove over something and heard a sound quite like a crunch. The police never questioned him about the damage to the Renault. At that time, according to Police Officer One's records, he also spoke to the occupier of Number 7, who is sadly now deceased, but she was unable to provide anything of any evidential value. On the 30th of May 1991, Police Officer One was really tracing down every lead that they could. Um, Police Officer One conducted witness interviews with a neighbour of the houses, so a neighbour of Colin and Leslie's, the neighbour's son, and the female who had seen Leslie at the petrol filling station on the 18th of May. Remember when she was almost filled up her car with diesel even though she had a petrol car and she was described as moving in slow motion and she was just kind of all over the shop really. Just didn't seem to be in a good way. Now the neighbour said that she had seen Leslie Howell in the Coleraine coffee shop on the afternoon of the 18th of May 1991. She also spoke of having heard heated arguments coming from the Howell address on unspecified dates. According to police officer one's notes, a neighbourhood son told the officer, I'm sorry, a neighbour's son told the officer that he had heard arguments coming from the Howell house on two or three occasions, but again, no dates could be specified. He then said that he could not make it at, make out what was being said, this neighbour's son, but that involved Howell or Colin shouting at Leslie and she was screaming back at him. Police Officer One spoke to a member of staff at the tanning studio and she confirmed that Leslie had arrived early for her appointment, as we, as we know, had left and then had returned back later prior to falling asleep under the sunbed and that Leslie had made this appointment for the following Monday. The witness said that Leslie had displayed no signs of being under the influence of alcohol or drugs at the time. Whilst Police Officer One made notes of the above interviews, he did not record any witness statements. Uh, Police Officer One then spoke to the owners of the Batik and Coffee Shop, who confirmed that Leslie had been in the shop on the afternoon of the 18th of May and had appeared in quote good form. He also spoke to a constable who had been a colleague and confidant of Trevor's, who was also a constable if you remember, at uh, Colorine Station. Trevor confided in him about the affair and had sought his advice. Uh, this this constable said that the week before his death, Trevor was, quote, in very bad form, causing him to speak to another church leader as he feared Trevor might take his life. So he was advised to keep a close eye on Trevor by um, the church leader. The constable said that he had last spoken to Trevor on the 17th of May 1991, when the latter had invited him to the evening service at Colleen Baptist Church on the 19th of May. So police officer one spoke to a police sergeant, who was actually Trevor's line manager at the time of his death, and he stated that Trevor had requested a annual leave on two occasions in 1991 in order to, quote, sort out family problems. When he had returned, Trevor informed this sergeant that he'd been working too hard and was not spending enough time with his family and appeared, quote, well down. He added, however, that Trevor was, quote, back up again shortly before his death. Police Officer One did not record witness statements from either the constable or the sergeant. Now, Police Officer One conducted inquiries into a suggested sighting of Colin and of Hazel in a laneway prior to the murders, which had led to an altercation between Colin and a local farmer. On speaking to this farmer, who could not confirm that the man he had confronted was Colin, the police officers re-interviewed Hazel and Colin on the 2nd and 3rd of July 1991, respectively. During these interviews, both Colin and Hazel changed their original accounts that the affair had ended in autumn of 1990. Ah, so the cracks begin to show. Then stated that it only ended temporarily before starting up again in March of 1991, continuing until a few weeks before the deaths. No further statements were recorded to clarify these differing accounts, and they were not referred to during the inquest. The police officer one conducted inquiries with Henry Clark's GP in January of 1992, Henry Clark being Leslie's father, confirming that Mr. Clark had been prescribed to Mazepam and Diazepam, and that would have supported Colin's account to the police that Leslie had found Tamazepam in her father's house following his death. Police Officer One also recorded in his relevant notes that the above drugs could not have been accessed by a dentist at the time. The forensic examinations. Let's get into this part. So Trevor's sweatshirt and jeans were submitted for forensic examinations and the uh, officer's rationale at the time was to ascertain what caused staining found on the right leg of the jeans and the left shoulder of the sweatshirts. He also requested that the jeans be examined for scuff marks. Results obtained in February of 1992 showed that human blood was present on the rear left shoulder area of the sweatshirt along with another unknown substance and nothing of note was found on the jeans. So no further forensic examinations were conducted on Trevor's clothing at the instruction of Police Officer One and these findings were not referred to in the coroner's report. There is no record of Leslie Howe's clothing having been submitted for forensic examination at all. Further forensic inquiry was initiated by Police Officer One in July of 1993 and the suicide notes purportedly written by Leslie 
Hal was submitted for examination in order to determine whether or not it had been written by Colin Hal. The examining scientist concluded that the note was not written by Colin. The rationale for this examination will be discussed later on. So the coroner's inquest report leading to an inquest. Okay, so there's, there's a lot that goes on in this case, guys. So following the above inquiries, police officer one prepared a coroner's inquest report, which included the following statements from Colin and from Hazel regarding their relationship, the counselling and the events of the 18th and 19th of May 1981, statements from witness B regarding his knowledge of the affair and the subsequent counselling, this however did not go into any detail as to how he became aware of the affair, a statement from a neighbour of the houses regarding her sighting Leslie, one from the female that had seen Leslie at the petrol station, one from the neighbour who had seen a car leaving the house at 3.40am, and statements from witness A and police officer 3 regarding their actions later that day. Also contained within this, in this, within this report were copies of the post-mortem reports, a copy of the suicide notes quote-unquote left by Leslie Howell, a May 1991 calendar page written on by her and photographs of the scene. Vacuum cleaner pipe was also referred to as a seized exhibit and there was no reference to the post-mortem photographs within this report. A number of police one's inquiries were not referred to within his report to the coroner. These included the witness interviews of witness C, the wife of witness B, later interviews of witness D, the owner of the tanning salon, the owners of the boutique and coffee shop, the constable uh, whom Trevor had confined, confided in and their supervisor sergeant. So there's quite a few statements that he didn't include in this report. Police officer one's report to the coroner concluded that, quote, the matter of two deaths was fully investigated by police officer one under the supervision of police officer two. It is believed that the deaths were brought about as the result of an affair by the spouses of the victims initially over the period of March to October 1990, and indeed afterwards, even up until the time of the suicide incidents. Neither of the suicide victims, despite reconciliation attempts by the church being made principally by witness B, could come to terms with their spouse's infidelity. Leslie Hal had made previous suicide attempts and was most likely the motivating factor in both of them taking their lives. Now, the combined inquest into the deaths was held on the 14th of May 1992, and the presiding coroner heard sworn depositions and witness evidence was heard from a number of people including from Colin and from Hazel. The inquest verdict was that Trevor and Leslie had died from carbon monoxide poisoning and that both of them had been emotionally upset by difficulties in their respective marriages. No concerns regarding the deaths were raised during the inquest and suicide was commonly believed to have been the cause of the deaths up until the second investigation in 2009. Now we're going to take a look and talk about that second investigation now. We're going to go over what that is all about and a little bit of what happened after this inquest took place. We're going to talk about Colin a bit more and then on to, you know, what happened in 2009. So in May of 1997, Colin married his second wife, a woman called Kylie Jorgensen or Jorgensen, depending on on where her surname's from. However, in August or September of 1998, Colin confessed to Kylie what he had done to Trevor and Leslie, as well as having an extramarital affair. However, at the time, Kylie did not go to the authorities. However, almost 12 years later, Colin had admitted to renewing an affair and losing 350,000 Great British Pounds in a Get Rich Quick scheme, which had in part come from a £400,000 payout following Leslie's death and was in part savings for his children's education. So that would have been insurance money. The scheme had claimed to find hidden gold in the Philippines. However, just before Christmas 2008, when Colin travelled to Manila, uh, confident he would be able to withdraw some of his money, he was given two ammunition boxes that contained a couple of silver dollars and old banknotes, which valued at around 30 US dollars. He was due to fly out to Florida to meet his wife and their five children for the festive break. However, when he called his wife to inform her of what happened, she had instructed him to move out of their luxury home. He did so while moving into a nearly deserted caravan park where he lived until his arrest in January 2009. He'd also confessed to his wife to abusing women patients whilst they were under sedation in his clinic in Ballymoney. These confessions came after the tragic death of his eldest son, Matthew, who tragically died in May of 2008. Now we're going to jump over now and take a look at some BBC articles about this, which has a bit more information. It's probably going to have a bit of re repeated information here as we go through it, just to let you know, but we're going to go through this. We're going to go through another one. 
we're going to get into what more happened because this case just just one that just keeps going the secret life of colin howell so this is a bbc article and it reads uh there were two sides to colin howell one was decent friendly and popular an upstanding and worthy member of the society as his barrister described him that was the person people in colreen knew for 20 years a committed christian successful dentist and a family man but there was another darker side and a secret life of lies and adultery and ultimately murder a monster and psychopath as he was described in court who planned the uh, described in court who planned the killings of his wife leslie and the husband of his lover hazel stewart the husband being called trevor a man who believed he was too clever to be caught and got away with his crime for 18 years until the day he walked into a police station and confessed now uh we know this information that we went over earlier and we know what happened here and we know that the um inquest found that according to the medical evidence both uh leslie and trevor had died from carbon monoxide poisoning uh the coroner went on to say that leslie was depressed on discovering her husband was having an affair and that the depression worsened after the death of her father which was 12 days before she died but we now know that what looked like a tragic double suicide was in fact murder. Colin had gassed his wife as she slept on the sofa in the home as he went over and he gassed Trevor as well. Colin believed that he would never be caught and his arrogance was apparent in an interview with the police on the 30th of January 2009. He told the detectives, I know I lived in a world of believing I could do anything, like a fantasy world where I could do anything and so I probably believed I could do it and get away with it. And those, those words apparently struck a chord with a journalist by the name of Derek Henderson who had followed the case closely and was actually writing a book about the murders themselves. Quote, Colin Howell was in love with himself in many ways. Colin Howell lived in a world that was not familiar to you or me or anybody else. He was a fantasist in many ways. So what made him confess? So there appears to be of these two factors within um, the reasoning that Colin decided to confess. And that was firstly the death of his eldest child, Matthew, who had been 22 years old and had died after falling from a balcony in Moscow while he was an exchange student. Matthew had actually been five years old when his father, Colin, had killed Leslie and it emerged in courts that his mother called out Matthew's name as she gasped for breath as Colin held a hose pipe to her face to poison her. Now during his police interviews Colin said he saw this in a biblical context and the sins of the father had been visited on the son and in his mind Matthew's death was God's way of punishing him and as we know the other factor was this scams scheme that he fell into that had all been a fraud he lost everything basically in that again he saw this loss of his investment as a payback for what he had done years earlier when he had murdered his wife and trevor buchanan he also admitted to police that he was a control freak who expected to get his way on all occasions and expected the women in his life to do as he said again let's refer back to much earlier when we talked about uh, Colin's attitude towards Leslie and the way he speaks to him spoke to her as if she was an animal using euthanasia and terms like that not treating her as a human being which you know she was he was questioned about the controlling manipulative side of his character by the police on the 30th of January 2009 when a detective asked him about the consequences of losing control in relationship he replied quote the relationship ended the extent of his influence and control was demonstrated by the fact that he persuaded his first wife leslie howell to have three abortions before they were married and hazel stewart to have one during their affair even after he confessed to the double killings colin howell continued to attempt to control his relationships from inside his prison cell in a letter to his second wife kylie written on the 30th of june 2009 he told her quote you must either write to me to clean the slates or now acknowledge i have done everything possible to be truthful and honest and now set yourself free to forgive during his cross examination the defense put it to Call him that he was a monster and he replied yes i was a monster and i was a killer but not any longer now in the second article we're going to see what more it tells us here because of course Colin wasn't the only person implicated within this hazel was as well but also on top of all that Colin's wife second wife kylie was investigated by the authorities so kylie was told by her husband colin about what he had done to leslie and trevor and he had persuaded her apparently not to inform the authorities for the sake of their children's future now apparently she'd been under police investigation since uh, colin's arrest in january 2009 colin first admitted to the murders to her at the couple's home outside castle rock 
in the summer of 1998. He was on the verge of handing himself over to the police, but they eventually agreed to stay quiet. And as it turns out, it was actually Kylie who had eventually forced him to confess everything to detectives after Colin was swindled out of all his money, including the family's life savings. Uh, Kylie left to return to the United States after Colin was arrested by the police, and she later filed for divorce. Uh, she must have been American, I believe. And the public prosecution service in Belfast confirmed that she would not face charges. Quote, the decision was taken not to prosecute in this case, because there was sufficient evidence to provide a reasonable prospect of conviction. Kylie returned to Florida to live with their five children and fly, filed for divorce when Colin was jailed for 21 years. We'll get to that in a little bit for the murder of Leslie and Constable Trevor. So yeah, as part of this, Hazel Stewart was also brought in and during this, she was 51 years old. And she had been his love at town murders and she'd been the reason why he'd done this in the first place. She was investigated by the police and was jailed for a minimum of 18 years for her part of the deaths and her role in covering them up. She'd already failed in a high court bid to appeal against a conviction for the murder of Leslie Howell, but she was at that point planning a fresh legal move in an attempt to clear her name. Spoiler, it was denied, any appeals were denied. So a new legal team headed up by a Belfast solicitor asked the Criminal Case Review Commission to examine the case and form a view on whether there had been a miscarriage of justice or not. Kylie was interviewed by detectives at her home um, in the days following the arrest of her husband and the arrest of Hayes and she admitted that Colin had told her in August or September of 1998 what he had done. She was feeding their first child in the lounge of their house outside Castle Rock at the time. Colin's four children to Leslie and her two from a failed marriage in Colorado were out with friends at the time. they just finished dinner and Colin told her there was something he wanted to say. He revealed exactly what had happened and what they did and Colin begged Kylie not to say a word to anyone. She claimed he told her, quote, just take a deep breath, take a deep breath. He, he waited seven years. You can wait one more day. We need to sort the children. So now we're going to take a look a bit further. I'm just going to talk to you about what happened in the subsequent trial real quick. So Colin pled guilty to both murders on the 18th of November 2010 and on the 3rd of December 2010 he was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term, um, minimum tariff of 21 years, so eligible for all after 21 years. Now, Hazel Stewart was subsequently convicted of both murders following a high-profile trial, which attracted intense media and public attention. And on the 16th of March 2011, she was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 18 years. A referral was made as part of the 2009 police investigation to the police ombudsman. Further, a brother of Trevor Buchanan and the daughter of Leslie made separate complaints to the police ombudsman in February of 2009 about the investigation. Let's take a look now now over at the complaints. Okay, so the complaints themselves here in the report. So let's take a look. So the complaints contained the following allegations, that the investigation had been ineffective, that the garage scene itself was not properly managed or interpreted, resulting in evidential opportunities being missed or overlooked, that there were concerns about the deaths raised by a serving police officer, and those concerns were ignored by a senior police officer in 1991, which was police officer three, if you remember, that members of the Coleraine Baptist Church influenced the 1991 police investigation in an attempt to downplay the deaths in order to minimize embarrassment caused to the church. So we're going to take a look over at what the Obudsman found out, what they learned. So we're going to go take a look. We're not going to go through the main thing because there are a lot of information. Uh, we're going to take a look at this summary here because if you went through the main one, which is about 40 pages long, be here for the next five hours. So we're going to go look at the summary, the summary of what they found, which is a lot more digestible. So the scope of the police ombudsman's investigation was to determine if there was any evidence of police misconduct or criminality in relation to the 1991 police investigation. Its objective has been to review the original 1991 police inquiry and to determine whether all available lines of inquiry have been pursued thoroughly as part of an effective and sustainable investigation. As part of this process, it was necessary for the police ombudsman to assess the investigative mindset and thought processes of 1991 investigators in order to establish whether or not they adopted an open-minded approach, which considered all investigative possibilities. This included whether the available evidence supported or undermined the commonly held belief at the time that deaths had been suicides. Now, it should be noted that all of the police officers involved in the 1991 investigation have now retired or 
are now deceased. And consequently, the police ombudsman investigation can make no misconduct recommendations in respect to its findings. And the police ombudsman, having reviewed all of the evidence, was satisfied that there was no criminality associated with the actions of any police officer involved in the original investigation. And therefore, none of the original investigative officers could be compelled to attend an interview by the ombudsman investigators and uh, their involvement and assistance was on a purely voluntary basis. So during the original police investigation, police officers one and two were the two detectives who conducted the majority of the inquiries. Whilst there remains a lack of clarity as to their respective roles, the primary focus of this uh, investigation on the actions uh, centers on the actions and rationale of these two police officers during the 1991 inquiry. In reporting on the actions of the police during the original investigation, a number of other organizations were referred to basically they did a big investigation. Now, crime scenes are vitally important sources of forensic evidence. Pretty, pretty common sense there. And of investigative opportunities. Investigators normally only have one chance to interpret a scene and maximize evidence gathering potential. Investigators worked the premise of the golden hour, that initial period upon arrival at a scene when the maximum evidence is available to them. Whilst forensic science and investigative techniques have advanced considerably since 1991, police were faced with a small contained scene at Cliff Terrace, which held a number of forensic opportunities which were missed or overlooked. Despite having a forensics uh, officer in a and a senior detective presence, the police failed to exploit fully all the evidential opportunities at the scene in respect of fingerprints, which we know they, they didn't take, and did not submit the vacuum cleaner pipe, cassette player, photographs, or a rubber gardening glove found at the scene for forensic examination. The cassette tape was submitted for fingerprints but proved negative. No inquiries were conducted around the issue that the vacuum cleaner pipe only loosely fitted into the car exhaust pipe, yet a dark ringed mark on the latter suggested that something had been previously tightly secured to it, or that the visible, clearly visible kink in the uh, vacuum cleaner pipe may have restricted the flow of fumes into the car. The car itself was not examined, particularly relating to whether or not there was any blood presence, which could have explained Trevor Buchanan's injuries. An insufficient number and range of photographs were taken at the scene. There was no scene log kept and no sketches or measurements taken. Specialist staff who attended appeared unclear as to their role. It's the first finding was that the 1991 police investigation did not maximize all potential forensic opportunities these, if fully explored, might have identified evidence which would have undermined the suicide theory. As the senior police officer, Police Officer 1, failed to direct properly police and specialist staff present at the scene to ensure that these opportunities were explored fully. Now, the police were faced with an unusual scenario upon finding the bodies of Trevor Buchanan and Leslie Howell. The discovery of what appeared to be a double suicide was unusual in itself, but was excavated by a number of issues. The fact that Trevor's leg was out of the car and that his driver's window was fully down, the unnatural and awkward position of both bodies, and the fact that they were not seated together in the vehicle. The loose fit of the vacuum cleaner pipe inside the exhaust pipe, positioning of the car in the garage whereby the passenger side was tight against the workbench, whilst there was room to walk along the driver's side. So in finding two, none of the above peculiarities were fully investigated and explained by the police. And this would indicate that the police from an early stage accepted the suicide theory, despite there being inconsistencies at the scene. This showed an investigative bias which was to pervade the entire 1991 investigation. Post-mortem photographs showed clear injuries to Trevor Buchanan's mouth slash nose area and what appeared to be blood coming from the back of his head. These were not identified at the post-mortem examination or included within the subsequent post-mortem reports. Police Officer 1 was present at the post-mortem examination and he was apparently made aware of Trevor's facial injuries by both a brother of Trevor Buchanan and a constable in whom Trevor had confided in in 1991. Now, Conan's explanation that Trevor had attended his house that night and that a struggle had ensued was accepted as facts. Colin's account was never challenged properly or tested. So finding three was clear evidence that Trevor Buchanan had sustained injuries, was overlooked, and as a consequence, no inquiries were conducted to establish how these injuries were sustained. Colin's account was accepted at face value despite evidence having been gathered during the inquiry that he had lied to the police. Now, at the insistence of Colin, three visits were made to Six Cliff Terrace on the 19th of May 1991 
prior to the bodies being found. The police were aware of this in 1991, and yet there appears to have been no suspicion raised about Colin's culpability, despite the fact that he had asked people repeatedly to go to the scene where he had disposed of the bodies, deposited the bodies. The police never challenged Colin on this issue in 1991, so the fourth finding was that the police failed to challenge Colin properly in 1991 as to why he was so adamant that Trevor Buchanan and Leslie Howell would be found at Six Cliff Terrace, which was Leslie's late father's property. Now, both Colin and Hazel lied to the police in May of 1991 about when their affair had ended. This lie came to the attention of the police when they were re-interviewed in July of 1991, but despite this, the police continued to accept both as credible witnesses. No other aspects of their accounts were challenged, including Colin's assertion that his wife had been at home on the afternoon of the 18th of May 1991, which was contrary to all those other witness accounts that they had. The finding five was that the police continued to show an investigative bias and adhered to the suicide theory, despite being aware that Colin and Hazel, the two key people promoting it, had lied to them in 1991. Witness D told the police in 1991 of the bathroom incident and also about her concerns regarding Colin's finances and that he was administering medication to his wife. I'm not sure what this bath bathroom incident is referring to. I'm not quite sure. I can't quite place it. There was other evidence freely available at the time to support these three lines of inquiry. Despite being aware of them, the police conducted no further inquiries to gather evidence in respect of issues raised by Witness D and Colin was never challenged regarding these matters. So the sixth finding was the information supplied by Witness Witness D was ignored by the police in 1991, despite it providing further lines of inquiry, which should have been explored. Police Officer 3 met Police Officers 1 and 2 in May 1991, where he raised those concerns, um, which we spoke about earlier. And apart from the police meeting with Witness D and her husband and conducting some inquiries regarding the laneway incident, which is the incident where Colin had that alleged fight with that farmer, these concerns were not explored fully by the investigators. The finding 7 was concerns raised by Police Officer 3 were not fully investigated by the 1991 investigators. Okay, so despite blood being found on the sweatshirt of Trevor Buchanan, no inquiries were conducted to establish whose blood it was, how it had come to be there, and what the other unknown substance found was with it. The police also failed to identify the origin of the marks at the bottom of the right leg of Trevor's jeans. Now, Police Officer 1 was aware that the blood had been detected on the sweatshirt but conducted no further inquiries in respect to the finding, and that was an important line of inquiry which was overlooked. When questioned by the police ombudsman investigators, he was unable to offer any explanation for this. And there is no record of Leslie Howe's clothing having been submitted for forensic examination. So the eighth finding was a significant evidential opportunity was missed in respect of Trevor Buchanan's sweatshirt, which may have advanced the police's investigation. So the suicide note, which was allegedly written by Leslie Howe, was submitted for forensic examination 14 months after the coroner's inquest. And this forensic submission suggested that police officer one did actually have some doubts regarding Colin. Despite this, no inquiries were conducted about discrepancies in the wording slash phrasing of the note. Police officer one did not explain what led him to submit that note at that stage. So the ninth finding being the content of the suicide note presented the police a significant opportunity to challenge the account given by Colin. And that was not taken. The submission of the note for forensic examination so long as the inquest couldn't be explained and is of concern. Despite the police conducting a number of inquiries in 1991 and 1992, these were not all documented in the coroner's report submitted by the police officer. Um, as we know, a lot of it wasn't included. The 10th finding was the impact of the presence of an investigative bias in the police investigation is that the report submitted to the coroner did not contain all of the available evidence and that narrowed the potential scope of the coroner's inquest. Finding 11 was that the failure of the police in 1991 to investigate properly the deaths of Trevor and Leslie was a serious one. However, there is no evidence that the investigation was adversely influenced by members of the church. Yeah, they didn't find any evidence that that actually took place in that allegation. Finding 12 is that despite all of the evidence available to them, uh, which existed in 1991 to the police officers 1 and 2, they never deviated far from the belief that the deaths were the result of suicide. This investigative biases inhibited an effective and thorough investigation, evidential opportunities which could have led the police to the conclusion the deaths were not the result of suicides were missed or overlooked. I believe finally we're going to be taking a look at the conclusion of this report before we round out our coverage here. Amidst the acute public interest surrounding the convictions of Colin and of Hazel, one must not lose sight of the victims. Trevor Buchanan and Leslie Howell were two innocent people whose lives were tragically cut short. Between them, they left behind six young children and a circle of family and friends who had to live for almost 20 years with both the grief of their loss 
and the belief that their loved ones had chosen to kill themselves. The police ombudsman recognized the considerable dignity and restraint shown by all of the families affected by the death since January 2009 as when Colin first admitted to the police and confessed to the police. Now, the inadequacy of the original police investigation contributed to Hazel evading justice for almost two decades. The families of Trevor Buchanan and Leslie Howell finally obtained justice for their loved ones in 2011, a series of missed op evidential opportunities in 1991 could have been avoided had a more objective and thorough investigation been concluded. Evidential opportunities were overlooked or ignored, lines of inquiry were not fully explored, explanations for inconsistencies and discrepancies were not sought, and the accounts of those later convicted of murder were accepted at face value despite evidence of them both lying to the police. These failures are all the more difficult to accept or understand due to the fact that the investigation was conducted by two experienced senior detectives. The police ombudsman concluded that both families of Trevor and Leslie were failed by the original 1991 police investigation, which was deeply flawed by the standards of the time and lacked objectivity and focus. And that is the conclusion of that, of the ombudsman report there, and it is the conclusion really of our case thankfully the truth did come out in the end i'm so relieved for leslie and trevor's family that the the truth did come out for them so they knew what actually happened and that leslie and trevor were innocent in this we can only hope that their friends and family have been able to move forward with their loved ones memories kept close to heart i'm so thankful that justice was served in this case and that colin and hazel are now behind bars for a long time. Um, so thank you so much to everyone for joining me. But all that being said, I'll see you in the next case. If you have any case suggestions, by the way, make sure to send them to requestacase.com. Uh, you can also see what other people have suggested over there um, and uh, vote on those too.